Previously on Edgecast, we showed you how to bring parts into a solid edge assembly and create simple relationships between them. If you haven't already seen the first part of this two-part episode, there's a link to it in the description of this video, and I highly advise watching it if you're new to solid edge assemblies. And now, the conclusion. Welcome back to Edgecast, the series where we show you tips, tricks, and best practices when using Solid Edge. In part two of this special episode, I'll cover the final seven assembly relationship types, not already detailed in part one, some of the time-saving and troubleshooting commands, such as CaptureVit, and how to replicate components with the steering wheel. For full details on how the steering wheel works, I recommend watching Edgecast episode four, which covers it in detail. So in summary of the last episode, we covered flash fit, mate, planar align, axial align, angle, path, and rigid set relationships. The remaining relationship types I'm going to cover can be seen in this list here. I'll start with one of the very specific commands, the insert command. There's no such thing as an insert relationship, but the insert command can place two relationships in one step, both an axial align and a mate. Here's the insert command in action. You'll notice that our prompt bar is asking for either a face to mate or an axis to align. If you choose a cylindrical face pair first, you'll only be able to place a mate relationship between the same parts, and vice versa. I'll choose the bolt shank first, and then a matching cylindrical face. You'll notice the orange section in the command bar advances one step when you click each face. If you click on the wrong face at any stage, just click the button that matches that stage, and you'll be able to choose another face. Now I'll select the two faces to meet. Conveniently, I can only select flat faces at this stage. And there we go. Now if you've seen the last episode, you might ask, why not use FlashFit? And yes, you can use FlashFit to do the same thing. But Insert restricts the face type selection, whereas FlashFit doesn't. And in a complex assembly, this might be extremely useful. Connect allows two keypoints to be brought together in 3D, which can be anything really. The corner of a part surface, the center point of a sphere, the midpoint of a hole. There's a large amount of freedom available with the connect command, meaning it's only really useful when there are no convenient alternatives. This also means that floating offsets are not allowed, as this would render the command more or less useless. Ball and socket joints are one instance of where a connect constraint might be useful or perhaps if a key point needs to follow a surface. In this case, tangent and cam commands would not create the correct result, and connect would be our only remaining option. In this example, I'm going to force the point of this needle component to be constrained onto the surface displayed in red. I also want my needle to remain upright, so I'm going to need to add other constraints to make sure I get the movement result I want. Let's use a floating offset mate to make these two faces parallel. And I'll press F to make sure the respective orientation is correct. Now for my connect command. I'll choose the point of the needle, and then the face. And finally, I'll verify the movement with the drag command. If I've done my work correctly, it should move over the face of the part while remaining upright. Now let's just check that the needle hasn't moved from the face with the front view. And as you can see, that's exactly the result I was after. If you need to make different pass axes or straight edges point in the same direction, but not necessarily align with each other, then parallel is a useful relationship. You can think of it as an axial align, but with an offset or range involved. With a floating offset, it means that positioning the edges of nuts and screws is much easier. They can be quickly aligned in the same direction as an edge of the part that they're constrained to. It's one of the lesser used commands, but still has its uses with geometry that uses complex faces. One possible use is to align a straight edge in a bolt with the edge of another part to lock its rotation. This is best done with a floating offset, as the distance between edges is unimportant. I'll start by selecting the edge of the bolt, and then set offset type to floating, and finally select the second part edge. 
as you can see, it functions in a similar way to the axial align command, but with more freedom. If two assembly components need to slide or roll along each other, it might be useful to apply a tangent relationship. The only rule is that at least one of the faces being related must be curved, cylindrical, or spherical. In my example here, this ball bearing must be placed tangent to the inside of the outer bearing race. As the ball bearing and the race share a common diameter, a tangent relationship can be used to make the two curved surfaces meet exactly and maintain their position. Let's hide the outer part to make it easier, and start the tangent command. Once again, it's best practice to click on the component you want to move, then the component you want to move it to. Floating offsets are unavailable, as once again they would render the resulting relationship useless. Sometimes, particularly with more complex machines, it's important to create a cam follower dependency between components. A tangent relationship might work for some instances, but this might allow the follower to drive the cam, not something that would happen in real life. Cam relationships mean that when the cam moves, so does the follower, but not the other way around. This very simple assembly has a cam which is free to rotate, and a flat-faced follower, free to move only in the z-axis. As you can see when I use the drag command on both of them. On the cam first, and then on the follower. They both have a range of movement. But now I'll start restricting that movement by creating a cam relationship. First selecting the face of the follower. You can define the cam first if you choose differently from this drop-down menu, but I want to define the follower first, which can be any face or even a key point. Now we've selected that face, I'll define the cam. Because I've made mine as a smooth or tangent continuous cam, I can do this in one step, instead of clicking each face with face chain selection. And I'll confirm the relationship. And finally, I'm going to verify the assembly moves as I want to with drag. The cam moves the follower. And as expected, the follower can't move the cam. This is the result I'm after. The match coordinate system command allows one component to have its base coordinate system moved to exactly the same position as an assembly custom coordinate system locking it in place in one step. An example of where this might be useful would be in a layout assembly, where you know exactly it is where you want to place something, but not exactly what you want to place. Solid Edge can create three planar alignments to existing coordinate system planes. It's situationally very powerful, and can allow irregular geometry to be fully positioned as long as it has a coordinate system. Fortunately, the parter assembly base coordinate system is impossible to delete, so this is guaranteed. In this room assembly, I've placed eight coordinate systems at places I know desks will be placed. And at a certain point in time, I then designed and brought in a desk. Here it is. First, I'll show the base coordinate system of this part by selecting it, right-clicking, and choosing Show Hide Component which brings up this table. And then I'm going to tick on Coordinate Systems to show you the part coordinate system. Finally, I'll start my Match Coordinate System command, select one coordinate system to move, and then the other. As you can see, this command fully constrains the desk in 3D space with three planar relationships. Center Plane is a relationship that can match one or two faces in the placed part to the mid-plane between two faces in the assembly. It's an associative relationship, so when you move the assembly components that were already there, the center plane related component will move with them. If you use the single option, only one face in the part being placed should be selected, and two in the assembly. If you're using double, though, you'll need to select two faces in the placement part and two in the assembly, for a total of four. Here I've decided that this office needs one more desk, so I'll copy one more in and constrain its base to the office floor.
As I've got no convenient planes that are visible in the middle of the part, I'll use the double method to imply a centre plane between two faces in the placement part. The two sides of the desk, that is. And with those two selected, I'll choose two other faces in the assembly. One. And two. And that finishes the command. I'll need to move it with other relationships, but its position in one axis at least is fixed. In any assemblies designed with some kind of drivetrain or motor, gear relationships might be needed to simulate motion. By default, two gear components selected will rotate in opposite directions, but you can also choose to place a rotation linear relationship from the drop-down menu. In my experience, the gear relationship is often misunderstood by users, because it can be applied between components that aren't gears, components that have no teeth, and components that aren't near each other. This might make little sense in the physical realm, but it could be useful if you're simulating a drivetrain linked by a flexible belt. But in this example, I'm not going to do anything quite as interesting. This is just a simple dataset with two gears, which I know have 48 and 40 teeth respectively. So that's what I'll enter in these two fields in the command bar. I'm going to create a gear relationship based on the number of teeth instead of the gear ratio. I could also use any cylindrical face or circular edge in the gears to apply the relationship. With this many part faces, turning off reduced steps may be useful. You'll notice during relationship placement that small indicators show the direction of the movement of each gear. I advise double checking them before finishing the command. They look good so far, so I'll finish the relationship, both counter rotating. In addition, if you're changing ratio or tooth numbers after placing the relationship, the affected gear highlights in green, which is useful in this case, as the gears are of similar sizes. And as always, I'll drag one gear to show that the movement is correct. Unlike cam relationships, either gear can drive the other. So that's the last of the assembly relationships, but here are some time-saving commands that may also be useful to you. The first example is probably the best known, capture fit, which recognises the relationships applied to a component and saves them for future use. The menu displayed here shows which relationships the component will learn when you click OK, and if the retain data box is checked, these save themselves into the part or subassembly being placed. What does that mean? It means that once a component has been placed in a particular way, with relationships and offsets, it can be rapidly placed with exactly the same relationships and offsets in a different assembly. For common or simple components, this could halve the number of clicks needed to fully position them. In this assembly, you'll notice that there's a bolt missing. I'm going to use the same bolt in many assemblies, and it's always going to be placed in the same way. So let's save these relationships to this part, an example of which already exists. The capture fit utility, which I'll start here, has recognised these two relationships, which I can review and remove from the capture fit if needs be. But I'm happy with this bolt remembering both of these, so I'll click OK. Now if I copy in another instance of the bolt, it already has the cylindrical face selected, and an axial align command started. So let's place it. It does help if you activate the geometry that you're trying to constrain your parts to with this convenient activate command. And there we go. Now a make command has started, so we'll select this washer. Once again, activating the washer first. And now we've constrained it in exactly the same way. If you're placing a component many times and you can't pattern it, capture fit can save you several actions per component. It might not sound like much, but with large assemblies containing hundreds of bolts, it all adds up. If you've selected something and the capture fit button is still greyed out, just remember that this command is available only when you have a top level component selected. If you want to change a component belonging to a lower level assembly, then you'll have to edit into that subassembly. Trying to do this from top level just won't work. Just above the Capture Fit button is the Relationship Assistant, which is Solid Edge's tool for rapidly finding, removing, or automatically creating relationships. 
It does this by checking if it can place relationships from the currently selected items against the selected option here, and then providing a list of suggested relationships which the user can choose. In this sewing machine assembly, there's an unconstrained component in this subassembly right here. This means I'll need to edit the subassembly to constrain it. Selecting this component and then running the Relationship Assistant will bring up this window. I'll see what other relationships can be made to the rest of the assembly, and then I'll look for everything except Connect Relationships, which I can choose from this menu here. Just be careful if you run these options in a large assembly, as the utility will try to process all possible relationships to all parts in the assembly. In this case, it's trying to create two relationships to sheet metal part 00184. Sounds reasonable. I'll review them, make sure both boxes are checked to create both relationships, then accept, finish, and review the result. Relationship Assistant is more or less a fast way to constrain assembly components in its current location, removing all previously placed relationships. I'd recommend using this on imported assemblies if there's no particularly complex mechanism at work, as it might save boring and repetitive work. On the other hand, it does involve putting your fate in the hands of a computer, so I always advise checking the suggested relationships before accepting in all cases. Alternatively, you can just use it to immediately remove all relationships affecting a part, and start from scratch. So this is all very well and good, but what happens if any of our relationships fail due to overconstraining? Do we need to remove all relationships to a component with this drastic option? Or do we need to manually search through all assembly relationships to find the conflicts? At ST9, a new relationship tool was created called Relationship Manager. It allows users to view a list of relationships, their properties, and filter them by type. Every relationship affecting the currently selected components will show in the list, here. And if nothing is selected, Relationship Manager will show a detailed list of every top-level relationship in the assembly, as you can see here. This shows rather too much information right now, so rather than check through 83 different relationships for conflicts, I'm going to filter only the failed, out-of-date, and suppressed relationships with the filter command, then check which of the reduced list are conflicting with each other. You can see which faces are being related by a particular entry by selecting them. The faces affected will highlight green. Now in this case, we know that there are some failed relationships, and we can also tell that this assembly is incorrect because of the misplaced battery cover. If you're in a hurry, or if there are too many failed relationships, the red medic symbol will be highlighted when relationship problems are detected. When run, this command will run multiple scenarios where random failed relationships are suppressed or deleted until no failures exist and then provide the scenario which suppresses or removes the fewest problematic relationships. If you want to run a more detailed manual troubleshooting, right-click any relationship, and it'll allow you to delete it, suppress it, change the variable value, etc. Once again, I recommend reviewing the outcome before saving, as computers aren't known for making good abstract decisions, and the result might need some tweaking by a human user. The result here clearly needs more edits, as in this case whoever moved this cover also suppressed a number of bolt relationships. Unsuppressing these with left-click, shift-left-click to select all of them, and then right-click, unsuppress, will return the cover to its correct location. As with many CAD systems, relationships are normally placed between part faces, but there are some times when this just isn't possible. For example, how would you relate the central axis of a compression spring to a cylindrical face? If we use an axial align, there's no face in the spring that the relationship can lock onto. But those of you with good memories will remember the match coordinate system command, which can relate an element of a part which isn't physical geometry, and what we needed to do to show the coordinate systems. 
We can do exactly the same when using Show Hide Component, which appears on the right-click menu in the assembly. The reference planes, part sketches, coordinate systems, and other elements can be used as key points, faces, or axes to fully position your geometry, after which they can be hidden again with the same method. In this example, we'll use the spring coordinate system to align with the damper cylinder. Select part, right click, and bring up this list, from which I'll select coordinate systems. Remember that Axial Align works on axes, not just cylindrical faces, and a coordinate system contains three of them. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the Z-axis to axially align the spring with the cylinder. This would also work if we showed part axes, but I have another use for coordinate systems here. As a final touch, I'll use the coordinate system plane to lock the spring's movement along the cylinder. My advice would be avoid showing all component coordinate systems or reference planes in a large assembly. You might be there for a while, and the results aren't useful or pretty, as you can probably see here. Any of you familiar with Solid Edge's synchronous mode will probably recognise the steering wheel, which is used to reorient and copy features. It makes a reappearance in the assembly environment, where it's used to reorient and copy components instead. For a full explanation of how to use and reposition the steering wheel, I advise watching the Edgecast episode regarding the steering wheel, where I explain its use in detail. The major advantages of copying components with the steering wheel are that you can copy many components at once, and also that you can copy existing assembly relationships to a new location without the need to use capture fit on every single part. Here's an example of circuit board assembly, and I need to copy this capacitor to three more locations while maintaining its relationships. Unfortunately, there's no pattern in the part I can use, but instead I'll just pattern them manually. There are other ways to do this, but that's a story for another time. First, I'll use the central sphere to position the steering wheel at the top of the hole in the circuit board. Then, holding control, I'll select another blue sphere at the end of this arrow to rotate the steering wheel around this central axis to point at a matching hole. Then, clicking the repositioned arrow with the control key held down, I'll copy a new capacitor directly into position. My options are set up to remake relationships to the surrounding geometry, so copies keep their mate relationships to the circuit board. Once you've copied parts, it might be useful to group them up to make your assembly tree a bit neater. Select everything you want to group together by holding down control and selecting all items in this case, all four capacitors, right-click and select Group. This causes a new group to appear in the assembly tree, making it more compact and making it easier for a user to select, hide or delete all of the capacitors. This concludes the assembly relationship guide. We've covered how to bring components into an assembly, all the available relationship types in Solid Edge ST10, and some of the admin tools available for assembly troubleshooting. Finally, we touched on how to use the steering wheel in the assembly environment to copy assembly components with relationships attached. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover, please either leave a comment below or send them to us by email at support at cuttingedge.co.uk. And be sure to tune in to watch the next episode of Edgecast, when we'll be discussing how to install and customise Solid Edge for the first time.